suburb quite close to Washington, D.C. Okay, none of the above. Very good. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Christian, and Christian's going to direct me when we need to do some polls. We're going to do um, some breakout sessions and get you guys thinking like impact investors today. Um, so I'll hand it over to Christian to take it away. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks for coming. And uh, this this month is a little different. I thought I thought that we'd have some more activities so everybody could do things instead of me just talking to you the whole time. So we're going to have uh, two polls. One will be on the chat room and one will be you get to fill out a yes or no question. Uh, and the other will at the end of the talk, you know, Mark can, Mark doesn't have to stick through the whole thing. We're going to have uh, a 15 minute exercise where you're going to have to research four companies and figure out which of the 17 UN SDGs, which are the Sustainable Development Goals, which SDGs do each of those four companies uh, accommodate? So that'll be the exercise at the end of the evening. Um, and I, you know, it's, it's interesting. I was thinking about, uh, you know, being a student and, you know, thinking about, you know, one day I'll graduate and, and join the job market and I'll need marketable skills, hopefully. And I wanted to say that, you know, one of the good things about these talks about impact investing is that impact investing is a young and rapidly growing field. So there will be more jobs in the sector by the time you finish college than there are today. And it'll, they'll need people. And one of the key skills, I think, that if, if you finish these, listening to these talks at the end of the fall and understood what the 17 SDGs were, it's that colorful chart that you got. If you were to study that and really get familiar with it and understand them and know how to apply them, which is the exercise, that's gonna be a very valuable and marketable skill that each of you can have. And if you walk into a, an investment bank and start talking about the SDGs, you'll get hired. So I just wanna give you a little bit of a financial incentive to, to focus on the SDGs. And they're also kind of cool. You know, the colorful chart is very, it's very user friendly and very um, uh, easy to figure out. And everybody in the industry is adopting them. It's kind of the new language of impact investing. So I just want to encourage you to, uh, to get familiar with all of that. So I guess we can start with the slideshow. We're going to go back and forth from slideshow to, to this. And I, I just want to, I'm also going to introduce Mark Grovick, who's our main speaker. Um, he's here on the call. I'll, I'll introduce you formally in a little bit, Mark, but welcome. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, so today or tonight, um, we're still talking about impact investing. That's the topic for the, the you know, all of these talks. You can, you can go back to the prior page. And uh, yeah, and today we're going to focus on two topics, education and workforce development. And the way that, you know, ed tech and work tech are two ways to talk about it. Uh, and these two sectors are sectors that really help with economic empowerment. And that's something that Mark does for a living. Mark, who will speak to us next. Mark works in the um, private equity sector. And Mark basically invests in private companies that uh, improve education outcomes or access to jobs. And in doing so, the people that, that benefit from those companies see an improvement in their income, a drastic improvement in their income. So, so the, the sort of impact topic we're going to talk about uh, in listening to Mark is really economic empowerment. Um, so here I am, Christian, and Mark is, is our guest. Now we can go to the next slide, please. So I thought I'd recap a little bit of what we talked about last month because it's been a it's been a month. Um, so the the topic, like the key topic last month, was ESG, and ESG is another um, term that I want you all to be really familiar with because it's a term that comes up all the time these days in the investment world. Uh, it stands for just a reminder: environment, social, and governance. And basically, E, S, and G are kind of the three key topics that 
um, that responsible investors or impact investors, you can use either phrase, think about. So, and you know, they don't all, not everyone thinks about all three. Some people are only focused on environmental outcomes. You know, they, they want their portfolio, they want the stocks they invest in or the bonds they invest in to not use plastics or to not, you know, to not, um, to not create pollution or to not put carbon into the atmosphere. So that's one way of being an environmental investor or to promote things like sustainable and regenerative agriculture instead of you know monoculture farming, which is destroying the soil. So that's like the E. The S are social issues. Um, uh, Anti-racism is a social issue. We'll talk about that next month, actually. Uh, gender equality, you know, paying women the same that you pay men, uh, including women in the workforce equally to men, uh, LGBTQ issues, um, uh, poverty, alleviating poverty, alleviating hunger, uh, alleviating income inequality. These are all social issues that we're starting to learn to solve in how we invest our money. So those are some of the S factors. And, and governance, governance, we're not really going to touch on it too much in this, these eight seminars, but what governance means is looking over the shoulder of companies and looking at how they run their company and are they running their company in a fair way? Like, is the CEO paying himself or herself, more likely himself, too much money relative to the rest of the employees? Like a, a statistic that people look at is, let's say you have a company of a thousand people and you, and you, you, you stack them by who gets paid what from the least to the highest paid the highest paid is probably the CEO. And then you look at the middle paid person, like the 500th person salary wise, what is the gap between the middle and the top? Is it 10 times what the middle person earns? Is it 20 times? That, that's a governance topic. It, you know, uh, and that number, the gap between the middle paid and the top paid, um, one of the first impact companies was the ice cream company, Ben & Jerry. And they set a rule early in the company that Ben and Jerry could not get paid more than four times what the middle or eight times what the middle paid employee got paid. And they stuck to that rule. Uh, the number now has never been higher. The average CEO makes 40 times what the average employee in their company makes. And that's so that's that's a, an example of a governance topic. Um, uh, and then the other recap point I wanted to make from last month is that the way that ESG investing usually happens is that people will take uh, like the S&P 500, all 500 stocks that are in the S&P 500 and do a negative screen. They'll remove, you know, the 20 or 50 worst companies based on their environmental impact their social impact or their go governance impact. We call that negative screening. And that's usually the first step for investors who are exploring responsible investing. Uh, and it's, it started in the you know, early mid 2000s. It, it was really inspired by uh, the then UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. Uh, he, and he wrote an open letter to the uh, investment industry saying, I'd like you to explore looking at environmental, social and governance issues in your products, in your mutual funds and, and the products you offer the public. And what would that look like? And, um, and the final thing on the slide, the report that came out of that study, which is kind of a groundbreaking report. And if you're, if you're bored on a Sunday night and have nothing else to do, uh, you can read that report, you can download it. It's called, Who Cares Wins? I think it's 2004, it's easy to find on the internet, just Google that you'll download it. And I've, uh, I always recommend people who are really interested in this topic to read that paper. It's kind of like the, one of the, one of the most important papers in the history of this kind of investing. So that's a bit of a reminder from last month. Um, the next topic, like the next level of responsible investing after ESG, the, the more, I'd call it the more sophisticated. And what I focus my career on these days is what we call impact investing. And it's impact investing is more 
it's, it's a much more surgical and focused approach uh, than ESG. ESG is very broad. Uh, it's, a, it's a big tent. Uh, impact investing is a lot more focused. Um, and usually investors like big pension funds or college endowments who, who start off with ESG, once they're comfortable with that and once they, they realize it has benefits, it, it usually actually improves the return and lowers the risk, risk meaning volatility. Um, the next step is then impact investing. It's taking it one step further, more focused. Um, and what impact investing does, it's not negative screening. It's not removing the bad actors. It's looking for the good actors. So it's finding the other Ben and Jerry companies. It's, it's looking through, um, it's, it's usually more applied to private companies than public companies. So you're not necessarily buying stocks. You're more likely buying, you know, looking for private companies that need financing. Uh, and we have a slide later that we'll talk, I'll talk to you about the financing cycle of companies. So impact investors, they're more focused on early stage investing. It's, you know, seed investing, venture capital, private equity. Um, they're looking for companies that by definition are trying to create a positive environmental or social outcome. A good example is Tesla, the electric car company. That's an impact investment. So, you know, when it was a private company, you know, certain investors found out about it. They were able to get into the company early. Um, they were investing in a company that would create it would you know, get rid of the fossil fuel burning car, the combustion engine, and, um, and replace it with clean energy, you know, electricity that's hopefully derived from solar or wind. Um, and it's been a great investment. You know, year to day, Tesla's up 400%. So you know, people who are wary of impact investing, they think immediately, oh, if I have a positive impact, I must be giving up some return. There's no way you could do good and earn money at the same time. And you know, those people are wrong. You can, it turns out that solving environmental problems and solving social problems can be very profitable. And there's nothing wrong with that. So that's, this is what impact investing is. It's looking for the good actors, investing in them, helping them grow. Um, Impact investing started off with foundations like the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, and they were, you know, along the lines of the missions of these foundations. And sometimes these foundations were willing to take a lower return, but more increasingly these days, uh, that's not you don't need that trade-off. Um, so it started as a sort of quasi-philanthropic activity, which is partly why it gets this reputation of being a concessionary investment, a, a lower returning investment. Um, and what's happened now is that impact investing is kind of going into two different camps. One camp is this philanthropic, uh, you know, like a Rockefeller Foundation or Ford Foundation type investment where, you know, they can just, they're foundations, they're in the business of doing good. So they can decide that, you know, well, if I invest in that, in that, organic arugula farm in Vermont, and it only gives me 5% return instead of a 10% return, but it's, it, it'll create good jobs, it'll create healthy food. Uh, I'm willing to take a lower return for the impact. That's philanthropic investing. Um, a lot of investors can't do that by law. They have to put the return first. And that's what I call investment grade impact investing. So. I just want to differentiate that there are two kinds of impact investing. There's the philanthropic, where you're willing to take a lower return in exchange for an impact. And there's investment grade, where the impact actually is driving the return, like Tesla. So we can go to the next slide. Two kinds of impact investing. And this is the next recap. Yeah, like I said at the beginning of tonight's talk, um, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals that came out of that, that, that uh, request from Kofi Annan to the financial sector in 2003, um, 
more and more investors are starting to map their investments to those 17 goals. And um, you've all gotten, you, sh you, you all should have gotten that, um, that very colorful poster um, emailed to you a few weeks ago. You know, that's a really good thing to memorize or to, or to get really familiar with and to understand those 17 SDGs. Um, again, it's, it is the future language of investing. It's already becoming, it's something I see in every report I read. Uh, and it'll be the, the, uh, the exercise we'll have at the end of tonight's talk. And again, it, it'll be to your benefit to really be fluent with them if you think you might want a career in the sector. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, and here they are. I'm just gonna, you know, j just to beat a dead horse to death, I'm gonna just read through them again because these are so important. So these are the 17 goals. And again, you can map your investments to these goals. No poverty is number one. Zero hunger is number two. Good health and well being is number three. Quality education, which Mark will talk about later, is number four. Gender equality is number five. Clean water and sanitation is number six. Uh, I think affordable and clean energy is number seven. Decent work and economic growth is number eight. Again, Mark will talk about that with his fund. Um, industry, innovation, and infrastructure is number nine. Reduced inequalities is number 10. Sustainable cities and communities is number 11. Responsible consumption and production is number 12. Climate action, number 13. Life below water, like healthy fish and healthy oceans, number 14. Life on land, like sustainable agriculture, number 15. Peace, justice, and strong institutions, Number 16, that's being talked a lot of, about a lot these days, like with what's happening in the Supreme Court. You know, is the Supreme Court still a strong institution or is it somehow being compromised? Um, 17, partnerships for these goals. So it's, it's kind of working together um, as opposed to being siloed. We can go to the next slide. So here's our first interactive moment on tonight's talk. Uh, so UVA, the university you attend, has an endowment of $10 billion. And uh, we're not gonna use this poll question quite yet. That's for the later poll. So what we're gonna do with this question, um, if you were advising UVA's endowment and you were hired to be a consultant, it's, it's something I do, for example, and you were, you were, you wanted to convince them to take one of the 17 SDGs and implement it in the portfolio. Which of those 17 SDGs do you think is most important for the University of Virginia to, to adopt and to change their investments accordingly? Like, so let's take a minute. Um, because there are 17 options, there were too many to do a poll. The poll is limited to 10. So what I'd like to suggest is in the chat room, you could open the chat, just write down, you know, take a look at the list of the 17 SDGs. You should have them, or we could even get them back up here. Which to you is the most important with regards to UVA? It's a public university, it's a public institution, it's in Virginia, it's your college. Which of these 17 goals do you think is the single most important for them to adopt? So take a few minutes. I see quality education, that's an obvious one. Affordable clean energy, quality education, quality education. Peace, justice, strong institutions. Affordable clean energy, two more quality educations. Sustainable cities and community, sustainable community, number 11. Partnership, I like that. Sustainable community, peace, justice, strong institutions. One, four, eight, and 10, I like that. Why, why, why settle for one if you can go for many? Quality education, peace, justice, and strong institutions. Great. Reduced inequalities, I agree with that. Um, 
I think it's really hard to limit it to one, quite frankly. Um, you know, most investors, you know, m little by little, college endowments are starting to look at their, because they're such powerful. I mean, I think the biggest endowment in the US, well, I know it's Harvard at $60 billion. And they have a team, I know them, I talk to them regularly. They have a team of 10 people whose sole job is to think about how they can add sustainability to their portfolio. And what effect will it have to the portfolio? Will it reduce their returns but have a positive impact? Will it, will it improve their returns and have a positive impact? Uh, which of the goals should they focus on? You know, um, and it's, it's interesting, you know, in theory, all 17, but you have to start somewhere. So, and not all of the, not all the, of the sustainable development goals are easily invested in. Like clean water is a really good goal, but many water, a lot of the water in the world is owned private, owned publicly. And there's an ethical issue with privatizing access to water. You know, it should be a public resource. But if it's a public resource, then, you know, how do you, you know, can we trust our public governments to take care of our water? You know, Flint, Michigan, obviously not in that case. So it's not always cut and dry as to how you implement these, these goals. And the financial markets are still figuring out how they can, you know, it's, it's something between the financial institutions and public policy coming together to solve these problems. And it's, uh, so that's, that's an important topic. Um, we can go back to the, so thanks everyone for engaging in that little exercise. Uh, we can go back to the slideshow, I suppose. Yeah, so I wanted to talk about a current event because that, that'll bring it to life a little bit uh, regarding ESG. So the, uh, the current Secretary of Labor uh, in the Trump administration, I think it's the fourth one in a row, is named Eugene Scalia, Gene Scalia. He went to UVA, he was my year, and he was my roommate my third year. And he's the current Secretary of Labor. Um, they, uh, I don't think it came from Gene, I think it came from people who work in the Trump administration, but they recently came out with a statement saying that, I'll, I'll read it to you, private employer-sponsored retirement plans, so in other words, private pension funds, are not vehicles for furthering social goals or policy objectives that are not in the financial interest of the plan, says Gene Scalia. Rather, ERISA, ERISA is the law that governs public pensions. ERISA plans should be managed with unwavering focus on a single, very important social goal, providing for the retirement security of American workers. So this statement came out I think it was during the summer. And a lot of us who work in the financial industry were very confused by the statement because it's, it's the way it's worded is saying that it's one or the other. You're either caring for retirement security or you're caring about social goals as if the two are in conflict with each other. And this is a, you know, the labor department doesn't understand investing. I'll just be polite. I'll leave it at that. Because furthering social goals and planning for retirement security are actually quite consistent with each other. It turns out that ESG investing uh, stabilizes returns. It lowers volatility. And if you're a very long-term investor, it's very good for returns. It turns out, it looks like. I mean, without, we don't have, 30 years of data, we have 10 years of data, but all these data suggest that um, it's very consistent to care about environmental, social, and governance issues when you're making investments. So um, when this statement came out, they also decided that they wanna to try to change the law. The, the Labor Department wants to make it illegal for trustees of public pensions to consider ESG factors, which, we in the industry find absolutely insane and ridiculous. And so um, I'm not a public policy expert, but by law, the Labor Department had to put this out for public comment. 
uh, I think for 90 days. And 90% of the comments back were 100% against this change. And 5% were in favor of this, this statement. And that 5% were the lobbyists who work for the oil industry, for example. So, you know, I, I just mentioned this because um, we're in a situation right now in the US where you have a, a federal government in power that is somehow against ESG investing. And this is one example of that. My guess is that if you care about the environment, you probably don't like big oil companies and big oil companies write big checks to politicians running on certain party tickets. So, you know, always look through statements like this and try to figure out, hmm, why would someone say something like this? It makes no sense. So I don't wanna get overly political, but you can't not get political when you talk about ESG investing. Um, but this is, this is in the news these days. You, you might, you know, I don't know what newspapers you read or what news you listen to, but this has been uh, kind of big news in the industry. So I wanted to bring it up. And it's connected to UVA because Gene Scalia is a class of 85 College of Arts and Sciences grad like me. So we can move on to the next slide. So now we're going to do a yes and no poll. Uh, it relates to the prior question. Do you think that pension funds should look at things like ESG investing or sustainable goals when they invest their money? Um, or do you think, do you, do you agree with Gene Scalia that you shouldn't look at things like that? It's anonymous, so, you know, I'm not gonna come, come find you if you say the thing I don't want. So the question is, should pension funds include sustainable development goals or other ESG factors as part of their analysis of the investment. So you can think about it for a minute. And if you want, uh, we could also pause for a minute and you could do a breakout session and talk among yourselves. I don't know, or. Christine, should we do a little breakout for a few minutes? Maybe uh, let's, we'll give them three minutes. Okay. To chat and I'll leave the poll open. Great. All right. All right, I'll put you in and I'll, we'll, we'll let you know in about three minutes to come on back and then we'll share Great. some thoughts. So you all talk with each other about this. And I'm not gonna join a break at room. It's, it's, all, it's all for you. All right, they're all getting sorted. I'll leave this poll. Great. So did you reach out to your roommate? We haven't spoken in 20 years. We're not okay. really, <laughs> we're not long. <laughs> well, the thing is we have a mutual friend and he asks her about me and I ask her about him. And we sort of, she's, she works for the UN in Washington. Uh, the That's UN. appropriate. <laughs> well, and the, you know, the sad thing is, you know, Jean's wife has COVID because they were sitting behind uh, Amy Coney Barrett at that super spreader event the other day and oh, wow. nobody wore masks and, you know. Yeah. Anyway. I was gonna ask, the, the, it sounded funny to me that that they would consider making it illegal. Is, is it like a, it's, it's like a it, it, free market? It, <laughs> they, they see it as kind of free market the regulation like that I mean, people aren't I didn't want to be in. rude I'm like, I mean we we've, we've been laughing it's like are you kidding like what? Yeah. this is like insane yeah. yeah it's just it's just we we I mean it's it's so crazy that we had to we we've all been laughing about it and literally the only like three three responses to the open open quest open questioning were from oil lobbies yeah Yes, make it illegal. Definitely make yeah, it illegal. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, the same people that want no regulation of any kind, you know, to get government out of business, and then all of a sudden they want it back in. That's wild. So, I mean, yeah, it's that's, not been, that's been the last four years. You you laugh at first, and then realize, oh crap, right. they're serious. And and then like and then like a month later, something even weirder happens. It's like, yeah. wait a minute, can it get weirder? And the answer is yes. It can. <laughs> so we're getting close to the point where it better not. 
I think in three weeks, I, I hope it's a paradigm shift. Otherwise, I'm moving back to Europe. <laughs> <laughs> I've said that the I've said that the past three elections, and I haven't moved anywhere. <laughs> well, it's, yeah, not not many other places will take us, right? Not no, now. not anymore. No. Brazil. Just, yeah, I don't want Brazil. Is that where I need to look? <laughs> I'm gonna answer yes. All right, shall I bring them back in? Let's see. How long have they been in their rooms? Uh. Probably long enough. Yeah, we'll bring him back. We we sent Mark into one of them, so <laughs> <laughs> whoever got Mark is lucky. Yeah. All right, they'll close in a couple of seconds. All right, I'm gonna end the poll and share results. This group reflects the nation. <laughs> Is it that's almost the result that, that the public comment period had 95 in favor, five against. So great. Great. Um, does anybody for extra credit want to be really bold and say something about it? Unmute yourself and comment. Just go go for it. Chris Young. Uh, yeah, I'd be willing to comment. I was one of the very few that said no. Ah, no, um, I said no mainly because I definitely don't approve of what Scalia is doing in mandating that they can't invest, but to have governmental interference on either end saying like they must invest kind of it messes with the free markets I'm, I'm a very free market kind of person if outcomes are higher for socially responsible companies then pension funds will start investing in them and that will lead more and more and more companies to start following those social outcomes which will bring about the change we want more than governmental interference I agree with that 100%, that point of view. And I, I don't think that those of us who work in the business are trying to force anyone to do ESG or impact. It's, it's, theirs. it's, it's really a set of tools. That's the best way to look at it. And you can use them or not use them. You know, all the big mutual fund companies now have an ESG version of their mutual fund. You could buy like the Fidelity regular US equity fund or the Fidelity ESG fund or you know, and it's up to you. No one's going to force you to, to do it. So, but I like that point, Chris. Thank you. It's, I like, I also believe in free markets, free choice. It's the American way. So anyone else have a comment or anything else to say? Okay. Um, let's go on with the slideshow, I guess. Yeah, so this is, these are just a few points I wanted to make about this topic. Um, you know, it turns out that ESG factors, there are two factors that investors, I mean, there are many factors investors look at, but at the end of the day, the basic two key factors are risk and return. Um, and risk and return are typically positive. The more risk you take, the more return you might get in theory. Um, so... Uh, one thing that ESG factor analysis can do, you know, if, if you look at your portfolio and look at, you know, you remove the worst polluting companies, you, you remove the companies that, that underpay women dramatically, you remove the countries, the, the companies that um, might have racist policies, you know, uh, what we find is that often you're also reducing the risks in your portfolio. You're reducing the risk that, you know, you know, Philip Morris, oh my God, they're selling products that cause cancer. The stock falls by half, you know. Uh, oh my God, the CEO is a sexual predator. The stock falls by half, you know. So it turns out that ESG factors can often reduce your risk. That's a good thing. It's not just about in increasing your return. Um, uh, 
It also turns out that if you're the CEO of a company or if you run a business and you think about these things, you think about like, let's, let's just say, you, let, let's say you own your own restaurant uh, and you think about, wow, you know, how much food waste do I have? I should really reduce my food waste. I should really, you know, how am I heating this, this business? How am I heating this room? Is it, is it sustainable or am I burning oil and polluting? And, you know, I bet you that my, my customers would, would prefer if I had organic food and, and sustainable. And if I paid my staff, well, there's a, there's a private equity company I do business with. And one of their investments is a fast food chain. But it's, a, it's an organic, hipster fast food chain in Southern California. It's not McDonald's. And one of the key factors that they, you know, and they pay, they pay their employees really well, including the people that work at the cashier. And the retention they have of staff who work on the front line is the average tenure is two years. People stay in their job for two years. The average tenure... I didn't check it. This was on the front. Uh, okay. The average tenure at McDonald's is six months. So, you know, having high staff turnover is expensive. So, by reducing your turnover by paying people well and treating them well is good business. It's good. It's good money. So, you know, <clears throat> it's smart business to consider ESG factors. And, you know, the third point in terms of return. Again, we don't have a lot of data yet. We don't have 30 years of data, but um, you know, it, it, it looks like ESG improves return. We certainly saw that last year. We're seeing that year to date this year. You know, keep your eye on the numbers. We'll, we'll find out, so. Now we're shifting gears entirely. We're done with me talking about ESG and impact and I'm preparing to, to introduce Mark Rovick. Um, one thing I became aware of after last month's talk is that, um, you know, I spend most of my day talking to people my age who are, who've been in this business for 30 years. And I, and I sometimes forget that, you know, right now I'm, I'm speaking to students who, you know, are, are in their late teens, early twenties. So I don't want to talk down to you, but I, I also want to make sure you understand some of the terms we're talking about. So I just want to walk you through this, this chart here. And Mark could probably do a much better job than I can, but I'll give it my best shot and Mark can certainly jump in. But basically, uh, this, is the, this is the life cycle of a company. Um, in the early, let, let's, let's go back to the restaurant. Let's say each one of us uh, is handed $10,000 to start a restaurant, a cafe or something, a, a, co a coffee shop, even better, so simpler. Um, the first stage of a company's life um, they call it here the valley of death. I mean, the, the one axis is time and the other axis is revenue, is income. So when you start a business, you're spending more money than you're earning. And luckily, someone gave us $10,000 to, to start the business, to sign the lease, to buy the stuff, to buy the coffee beans, the cups, the tables, hire the first staff. We open the door. We're in business. Those first investors who gave us the ten thousand dollars is is probably your grandmother and <laughs> someone like that. Those are called angel investors. They're angels, uh, and the money they give you, we call that seed capital. It's they're seed investing your new business. Uh, it's usually FFF friends and family. Um, it's it's usually not a good investment. Maybe one in a thousand will be a good investment, but it's usually someone doing you a favor, you know, someone giving you a break to seed invest your business. And once you come out of the valley of death and start to earn revenue, you're now in the venture capital stage of the life of your company. Uh, and you can now, you're, you're now eligible to seek venture capital investments. Um, uh, and, you know, first, second, third mezzanine, you know, you can, you can early stage, we call it series one. The first time you go out and raise private, it's, it, we're, st we're still raising private money. We're not on the stock market yet. So you can go out and raise money from, from uh, professional investors. So a series one is your first attempt out to raise money. Maybe you'll, 
get a million dollars. And, you know, everyone now, the people that invest the money have an interest in your business. You know, they, you're selling part of your business, but to private investors. And then series two, it's the second round out to, to raise more money, a second round, a third round. By the third round, you're still in the venture capital world, but it's later stage, it's not early stage. Um, and at some point, you know, you've proven your business skills, you've proven that you can make money and we call it growth capital. You know, it's to grow the business, it's to open the second and third and fifth cafes, uh, you know, to take out ads, et cetera, to expand, expansion money. Um, and then let's say you get so big, you know, you're, you're like a mini Starbucks, you're ready to hit the big time. Uh, you haven't, you can, you can decide you want to float the company on the public stock market and you want to offer it to shareholders, to the general public. You have an initial public offering, an IPO, uh, and then you cross the line into the public markets and you can raise more money. You know, you can have a secondary offering, you know, raise more money in the public markets by issuing more stock. And then you're a public company. People can buy and sell your stock. So uh, the business that I do most of the time in my own personal private uh, business life is working with venture capital and private equity investors. And these are the people that are past the valley of death stage. I don't do seed capital, but in the early and later stage cycles of, of privately owned companies. And I help to find the money to invest in them from investors. Uh, I don't invest directly in I don't find money for single companies. I find money for fund managers who in turn put companies together and they usually focus on one sector or one theme. Uh, so Mark Rovick, who's our speaker tonight, works in this middle sector of, of you know, raising capital from investors. And then he puts that money to work in private companies that are in the growth stage of their business cycle specifically companies in the education sector and the workforce sector. And with that, we can go to the next slide. Um, oh, sorry, I have one more thing before Mark. Uh, so there's a group of, of venture capital and private equity managers in the impact space. So managers in that middle phase um, that have come together and they formed an association to help each other out. And it's called impact capital managers. Um, it's about two years old. It's a membership organization. It's like, you know, it's, it's a bunch of like-minded companies, fund managers who work in impact investing in private equity and venture capital. And uh, you can go to their website. I, I recommend it. You can poke around and see who's there. There are about 60 members now. Um, and in my, this, this is one of my favorite groups of investors. These are the people that I like to work with. Um, Two of them are my clients. Uh, and to me, this is the new breed of investment manager. Um, the next slide, please. And here's a list of some of the members. It's, it's kind of small to look at, but you have everything from an enormous firm like KKR. Uh, I'm sure many of you have heard of KKR. Uh, you have, I don't know if, if you can see them here, you have, uh, Morgan Stanley is next to KKR, but you also have tiny firms. There's one, if you go five rows over and three rows down, the Impact America Fund, that's, that's for female black venture capital entrepreneurs. <laughs> that's the focus market of that fund. Keisha Cash is the woman who runs it, wonderful person. Uh, so you have everything from an incredibly focused fund company like that to Morgan Stanley that does, you know, they also do impact, but at a much larger scale and with a much broader set of, of interests than black female entrepreneurs. And it's, it's a wonderful organization. I love the breadth and depth of the managers who are part of it, including Mark Rovick. Next slide, please. So Mark is the founder and the general partner of New Markets Venture Partners. It's one of the funds on that, on that list. Uh, they're, to me, one of the leading growth stage, double bottom line. I'll let Mark explain double bottom line investors. Uh, they scale. I took this from his website. They scale transformative technology companies 
which improve education and workforce outcomes, which lead to superior financial returns. And now I will turn it over to Mark Rovick. Thank you. And Mark has his own slide deck, which he'll use. Good, thanks, Christian. Thanks. Um, that was super interesting. And, and I had a chance to speak with uh, Lauren in the um, breakout to get a little sense of the class. Um, so appreciate everybody's interest in the field. It's something I've been doing for 30 years. And you know, reflecting on Christian's introductory comments, I can't imagine investing in something that didn't make the world a better place. I feel like my life is very short and what we do is very precious with our lives. And so not investing in things that improve social outcomes would seem like a waste of my talents. And, and I think everybody on the, on the Zoom is pretty talented just to get yourself where you are. So you, know, you would ask yourself, does that come with a certain level of responsibility to make an impact, to have a legacy? to do something positive. Um, so I certainly feel that way. And I'll talk a little bit about why we focus on where we focus. And that was kind of some of Christian's questions, like where do you think um, an investor should focus in those ESG? And as you think about, if you do wanna spend your life making the world a better place or leaving a little something behind, you know, what interests you in terms of uh, both sectors and, and projects to work on? I'll give one comment on that um, lifestyle, life, uh, life cycle of a firm. Something I think pretty important about what we do that a lot of people don't think about. Most people who do think about it, this will be obvious, but private equity takes money and gives it to a company in return for shares. That cash sits on the balance sheet. So those of you who have any sort of accounting background, right? The shares go out, the cash comes in and that balances. And then we go on the board of directors and we work with the management team around a vision to spend that money to make the company successful. When you're buying a public stock, that stock is being traded among two individuals in a secondary transaction. The company doesn't get the money and you don't sit on the board. And so my little pitch for private equity and entrepreneurship, which I taught at College Park for 20 years, is get in the boardroom where the action is. Be an owner. Start a company. Be an investor that sits on a board with the management team. That's where the action is. That's where the vision is. That's where the impact is. You can make a very nice living in an investment bank, helping people buy and sell shares of stock or being an equity analyst. And those are very good uh, rewarding career. So I wouldn't disparage them, but I'm, I'm telling you for me personally, working with a company around spending money that we invest as a board member with the management team that created a vision to make the world a better place. I can't think of anything more exciting to do as a profession. I'll tell a quick story about one of my students. So this, the left side of that life cycle was um, angel investing. And, um, this is wealthy people with their own money, usually for psychic benefits, not for return. Like Christian said, it's a pretty hard asset class. So one of my students, um, I taught MBAs. So he was in his you know, early 30s. His father-in-law passed away, left he and his wife some, some money. And um, he was going to become an angel investor. And he said, well, I went to the incubator at the university and I found a biotech company and will you help me look at it? And I said, absolutely not. I refuse to have you put your hard your family's inheritance into a biotech company. And so there's three rules about angel investing that makes people successful. Invest in what you know, get involved and do your homework. And so long story short, that student um, at the end of the semester, I said, just take the class, learn about private equity. I have a ton of deal flow in our firm. Maybe you'll see something you like. Long story short, at the end of that, he joined a, uh, an early stage company as number two to the CFO and invested $200,000 and got a pretty good job. So he joined the firm and he put in $200,000. And eventually after about four years, he became CFO. And when that company sold, he made $14 million. So it's really hard for service providers to buy big houses in fancy neighborhoods these days. Lawyers, doctors, accountants, consultants, there's not a lot of large wealth creation that's happening in these service sectors. 
And so if you want real wealth creation, I would encourage you again to become an owner. And we are owners when we buy into companies and entrepreneurs are owners. Get yourself in the boardroom, in the equity stack and have some vision to make the world a better place. And that's where the action is. So that's my little commercial about what I do. Um, we can go to, uh, to some of the slides. The other thing I want to do, Christian, I know we haven't really set this up for this, but so I'm a founding board member of that impact capital managers group that Christian mentioned, uh, started that with a few veterans. And, and like I said, literally I've been doing this for 30 years. And so, um, we started a fellowship for, um, uh, minority MBAs to come into those impact funds. And there were 10 of those. And I stopped teaching about five years ago. I was in the classroom for 20 years. And I was particip participating in some training for these 10 fellows this summer. And what struck me, and you know, I'm a little surprised I don't miss teaching as much as I thought I would, because it was a big part of my life for a long time. But they asked the best questions all summer. And I was absolutely in heaven answering these 10 rock stars because uh, this, this, this fellowship that we had um, called the Mosaic Fellowship to these impact funds, we had about 200 applicants for these 10 spots. These people were amazing. And so I could have sat all day and answered questions. And so what I want to do is I, I have some slides to go through, and I know that that's kind of what Christian wants, but I would much prefer to answer questions. So why don't we throw some slides up? And if you want to put a question in the chat, I will see it and I would much prefer to have a dialogue with some really smart people who are super curious. I would love for the folks who have their screens turned off to turn them on. And I would like you guys to lean in a little bit with me. Um, I've got teenagers and family out of town and I want to take my time to give as much as I can to you to give you a couple of things that you can take away to make your lives more successful. And by that, I mean, double bottom line successful, more financially successful and more fulfilling on whatever emotional or spiritual level you guys have. So I'm going to spend, you know, the next half hour doing that. Would love some engagement from your side to make sure that I, I do my best to be of service to you. So go ahead and start any questions. Um, but uh, why don't we throw the slides up? All right. So we go to the next one, I think. And that is one more. Um, we could skip the team, I think, um, could skip the advisors. Okay. So here are some of our metrics. Um, we have number of students served. So we have 25 million folks that we, um, that we impact. And I'll tell you a little bit about how I think about impact. Um, we have, uh, Another thing that you'll find if you're many years in the private equity industry is it's pretty easy to, um, to get money out. And a lot of young people are really excited about making that investment. But after you sit for five or 10 years with a company, and especially if it's not successful, you want to make sure you can get the money back. And so you start to have this vision of making sure the investments that you make um, have liquidity. And Christian mentioned IPOs. Well, we've had two IPOs over the last 30 years. And most of our, what we call exits, come from mergers and acquisition transactions to strategics. And after 30 years in the business, we start to know all the buyers. And that's really interesting. Um, this 23.6% is, um, you know, you can think about that versus a risk-free rate, which is currently... I would guess two percent, something like that. I don't. I don't really zero. know. Zero. <laughs> LIBOR plus a couple of points, and then um, you know one thing we don't have on here. I think it comes up later, but we have a ten percent loss rate, which is really low for a venture firm. And we brand ourselves as efficacy focused investors, and I'll talk more about that. And that's kind of, you know, again, why would you be involved in something that didn't work? There's a lot of people that invest in things to try and make money but the product doesn't work. And what does it mean to work? What kind of value proposition is there to the end customer? And that's a lot of how we define impact. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we can go to the next slide. How would you recommend being an owner? Yep, yep. Um, PE funds are investing in private prison companies. Yep. Well, we do the opposite. Let me let me address that second question real quick. So we have a company that invests in um, education, job training, social emotional, um, 
uh, education and um, substance abuse um, therapy in the prisons. So it's kind of the other end of the spectrum. These these private prisons um, are do have some some bad actor reputations, and there is some exploitive people in the penal system. And I'd highly recommend a documentary called Thirteenth if you guys haven't seen that about the Thirteenth Amendment and the uh, education to prison and, and uh, prison and, uh, industrial complex. Um, but we try to mitigate that. We have a company that does sort of the opposite of being a private prison. And that's trying to reduce in our, in our impact metric there, which is really important. I want to get to how we think about impact is reduced recidivism. And you start to think, you know, really, what does this mean? You take a group of people that don't have our programs and you take a statistically identical group of people that do have our programs and the people that go through our program return to prison at a 12% lower rate. And that's a number of people not costing taxpayers, their lives are better, the economic costs are lower, right? So you start to think A-B testing and does it work? Okay, we'll get, we'll get to that more. One thing that I, I think would be really good for people to ingest is, we're calling it now a theory of change, but I always, as even as a, uh, a high school, I started in, in end of my high school, I had kind of a point of view of a topic I was interested in working on. And so for me, it started as economic development. And so in high school, I was interested in some international economic development. It really helped in college focus on a major, it, it, but if you have a problem you want to work on, and some skills on it, it makes your interview much better when you're talking to somebody. You're out at a business meeting. You have a point of view of what you want to change and some skills at how you want to do that. Your life is going to be a lot easier. And I know for people who are like, I don't know what I want to do. I don't know what problem I want to solve. That sounds really challenging. I would say, do some work. Spending some time thinking about what mark you want to leave on the world, what problem, what industry you're interested in start to read the journals start to read some industry research you will have better conversations you will be more successful your skills will be more um, impactful and leveraged if you start to learn an industry and i would recommend one like and so i'm going to talk about what we focus on maybe climate change is a bigger problem in the world so you guys unfortunately and and, and women uh, we have a legacy from people my age and the generation before of catastrophic climate change coming at you like a freight train. Congratulations. Um, pretty interesting industry to do something about. We don't touch that industry. So maybe I'll say, I don't want to be grandiose and say what we do is the most important, but so maybe climate change. But what we're addressing is this economic gap that's growing in this country that's creating political instability. And the haves and the have-nots and the people that are being left behind in a country that is so great about economic mobility and land of opportunity. And to lose that as a country is not only just heartbreaking in terms of a theoretical, this is a great country, but you think about the people that are being left behind. So if you put that slide back up, sorry. This is kind of a, a mind-blowing stat. And it's really interesting to think about where you are in this stat. So I have 100 people who start high school, 85 graduate high school. So 15 folks are lost right there. And this is the only statistic of this chart that I'm about to go through that has improved in the last 10 years. It used to be 79% of people graduated high school, and now it's 85. So we had 500 basis point, 600 basis point improvement, and I've invested in a couple of companies that improved high school graduation rates. I'm not saying I can take credit for it, but... Actually, it was, I'll drop a name because I think it was a pretty good comment. So one of my closest friends is uh, Dean Ian Solomon from, uh, from the uh, Batten School. And he was, I was talking to him about these 25 million students and everybody that we've helped, but none of these statistics have changed. And he was, we had a really interesting conversation. Was it enough that we improve the lives of 25 million students or do I need to feel successful that I'm creating 
uh, systematic improvements. And I really feel like this chart should have changed more for me to say I've done a good job over the last 20 years. But Ian was urging me to be, be um, uh, not satisfied, but at least grateful that I was able to impact 25 million students. So we had that kind of conversation on a hike. Um, so of these 85 students that graduate high school, 57 enroll in college. So you're losing another, um, let's see, that would be uh, 28 students who, so 15 drop out of high school and then 28 don't enroll in college. So now you're about a third aren't even in college. Then half the people graduate college who enroll. And so this 57 goes down to 34. Most of those drop out their first or second year. And by the time people graduate college, 30 are left out of 100. So 70 students out of 100 have been flushed out of the system. And I have a lot of stats that I don't think are in this shorter deck. But if you don't graduate college these days, you are not in good shape to live a life of economic mobility. You are not going to do as well as your parents. Your average income for your life is under a million dollars versus four million if you graduate college. You're not going to have a backyard. You're not going to own a house. You're not going to have barbecues. You're not going to retire with money, right? So 70% of students are being flushed out of the system. And more and more economic inequality is happening in this country. And it's causing a lot of pain. And people want change. And people are voting certain ways that might not be good for global stability, right? It all starts here, in my opinion. That's why I think what we do is so important. And then just a couple of tidbits for you guys. Of the 30 people that graduate college, 15 of those get jobs that they are not underemployed or unemployed with. So half of those people get jobs fully to their employment level. By that, I mean the other half are either unemployed or they get jobs that don't require a bachelor's. And then there's only a 25% satisfaction rate with people who get a job after college. And that rate goes up to 75% if you have an extra credential have little or no debt and have job experience. So your chances of having a job that you're satisfied with and happy with if you graduate college are three times higher if you have an extra credential, little or no debt and job experience. And so very, very few people are set up to get a job that they like starting from high school. And that's the problem we go after. We go to the next slide, but let me take a look at questions. I love it. Yep, we're we're solving the climate change by filling the education gap. Um, number one mistake: making a significant investment. Hard skills have become the most important success in my field. Um, all right, so a lot of questions about venture capital. Uh, where do we go with that? Let me, let me answer some of these. Um, most important thing we look at investing in these companies is uh, the management team and then the um, product market fit, gross margin, making sure that they can make some money on what they do. A lot of these are technologies with some services around them. Um, you know, what, one thing I would suggest is our website is pretty good in terms of uh, criteria. So on our website, we try and have questions we ask and the criteria we look for. So I will punt on that one and let you guys explore the website a little bit. Um, most companies come to us, but that's a mistake on our part. We do have a number of investment thesis, like um, right now, some things around apprenticeships and on-the-job training and, and doing credits while you're at work is a really interesting um, investment thesis for us. And we do track companies that are in that field. But because we are a leader in this education and workforce space, pretty much everybody, if you started an education and workforce company, you would probably come to us for money if you were um, doing your homework. Um, and so we do get to see almost every deal in the space. Uh, do entrepreneurs, hard skills for our business. Um, 
accounting, finance, and then entrepreneurship um, would be the the skills um, to get in our field. You know, go to work for an early stage company or a family office. Um, work on work on deals from a corporate venture is also a pretty interesting space that people don't think about. Um, so there's a lot, there's very few jobs in venture capital, but if you include family offices and corporate venturing, there's a lot more jobs. Number one mistake people make. People are, the, investors swing from greedy to fearful on the drop of a dime and neither one of those. So I have a top 10 list I share with my MBAs at the end of the, uh, I can even cut and paste it here probably in a second at the end when Christian, when you're wrapping up, I'll cut and paste that. But one of them is don't, don't be motivated by fear or greed. And so the biggest mistake investors make in my mind is they're either motivated by fear or greed. And then they make different mistakes depending on if they're motivated by fear or greed. But if you're really emotionally intelligent and you can understand, okay, right now I'm feeling fearful or I'm feeling greedy and you can check those emotions a little bit label them and, and make sure you're not investing from those places. Um, double bottom line, financial goals, positive social impact. The financial game is so low. Um, so we don't, we don't keep investing if the financial gain goes away, even if the social return is there. So we need both of them to continue. <coughs> In fact, if, um, you know, there's an expression, you don't want to, throw good money after bad. So if, if the company's going south, you know, we, we do a pretty good job salvaging. That could be a whole nother talk about turnarounds. And if investments go south, what you do, we do a pretty good job. Like I mentioned, we have a 10% loss rate. So I would say up to half the companies that we've done well on have, have required some Herculean efforts to turn around a company that was going in the wrong direction. And that's, I think, what makes a good venture capitalist is somebody that really can change the trajectory of a company to the positive. And then to also know to be self-aware enough to know what we can and what we can't do. Like some of my partners think they could do a little more than they can actually do. And some of my partners think they can do a little less than they can actually do. So it's interesting to not be overly confident, but also, you know, just say, Oh, we got to just back management. We can't, we can't do anything that can really help. Um, all right. So let's throw the slide deck back up. Let's see if there's any more questions that are coming in. That's good. Yeah, keep them coming. And I, I wish we could speak, well, I really wish we could speak in person. Um, if you go to one before, yeah. So these are metrics that we're going after, right? And, and when I say it's good if you can really identify a problem that you wanna go after to solve. Um, these are some of the metrics of the problem that we're trying to solve. So it's not just the student one that we talked about, about the people left behind, but you can look at um, a lot of these statistics and see how we have a country of 320 million people with a lot more people suffering than you would think about. And, um, and so creating, and there's also a nice uh, Gandhi quote, I think, that says the measure of a society is how they treat their most disenfranchised. And so from a very spiritual or personal point of view, I like to spend my time trying to help the underdog. You know, if I'm watching a football game, I'm always going for the team that's behind. And it's just kind of how I'm wired. All right, next one. Unless it's the Bears. Um, okay, so global pandemic. Yeah, so what we do, you could, you could imagine uh, job training and distance education online. Ed tech is probably doing pretty well these days. Um, not that an economic collapse uh, is good for business by any means. Um, we're, we were raising a uh, $250 million fund, and now I think it's more like a $150 million fund. But maybe Christian has something to say about that. Maybe we'll be back to $250. Um, but, uh, you know, there's definitely headwinds, but we are in the right industry in this time to really be doing well, and our companies are doing well. And we can talk more about what we've done to stabilize our companies and all the economic development and, and economic stimulus coming from the government and what's happening with supply and demand of our products. But let's go to the next one. Okay. 
So I started to talk a little bit about the lens of the problem. Now, these are the solutions. You know, you think about these barriers that I've laid out, the challenges are on the left. And you think about from cradle to grave, it's kind of interesting. And, and I'm really loving stat driven investing these days. So if you don't have a certain number of words by the time you're entering elementary school or kindergarten, your long-term outcomes are much lower. And then you think about parents who have two jobs or don't have the ability or the culture to sit and read to their kids. Like both of my kids got read to by both of us every day. And that is just an amazing head start that a single mom working three jobs doesn't have the opportunity to do. Third grade literacy, if you're not reading by third grade, sixth grade math skills, if you don't have good sixth grade math skills, there's career and college readiness in high school. That's very uh, measurable. Graduating high school, college entry, transferring from community college to four years, another big one. There's lots of people that fall through the cracks. These are where people can fall through the cracks. That's another way for me to look at it. Graduating college, having um, job recognized credentials, job recognized, uh, I'm sorry, uh, labor market credentials, labor market skills, and then good quality jobs. We're, we're focusing more and more on it. Just because you have a job, does it have some of these governance and equity issues that Christian was talking about? Are employers working with their employees in the right way? <clears throat> and there's this whole industry called the future of work that we're leaning into now, which is fascinating around um, people being displaced by technology and the gig economy and 21st century skills. And um, uh, what else would be in there? Um, more, more of these ESG sort of goals at the employer, a um, whole bunch of things around leadership and ethics. You know, when you were talking, Christian, about should people consider ESG, you know, part of my philosophical brain was saying, where, where are the ethics in all this? You know, at what point does investing in um, uh, oil and gas or pornography or, um, you know, what else would be really cigarettes, right? It, is there an ethical issue here? Is there an ethical issue? In, in the first place I worked, I didn't talk much about my career trajectory, but I worked at the Calvert Group, which was a mutual fund that screened out the sin stocks, like Christian said, and they were really the, the pioneer in what we called socially responsible investment. And I worked there starting in 1990. And Calvert was a thought leader and they started business for social responsibility, student for social responsibility, investor circle, um, all these things. And, and they were really pushing the ethics in the boardroom as a way to go after what we're talking about. And if you're a highly ethical person, can you at the end of the day dump chemicals somewhere, even if it's legal? You know, and then how, how aggressively mission oriented do you want to be in terms of different at risk populations but i do think there's an ethical play here so this is some of our screen and you can see some of our uh, innovations and outcomes one one nuance that i think is worth sharing because it's come to us in the last few years i like i like the business because you keep learning every deal for me is still a really big learning curve after 30 years so it's kind of neat to learn about a new company and make new mistakes all the time. But one of the nuances that we've learned recently about the impact measurement is to have two levels of, of things that we're looking at. So for a long time, we wanted to make sure the product worked. Like, does it raise sixth grade math scores? And we can talk about testing regimes and I, sometimes I feel bad about that, but you take a bunch of low income kids and you get their sixth grade test scores up, their outcomes are better. And so we invested in some of those things. But the second level of screen that we're spending more time is, is this bigger macroeconomic to make sure that if you're raising sixth grade math scores, that the long-term benefit is there. And there's a lot of research around these sorts of uh, correlations. And so we're getting more research driven and more focused on two levels of efficacy. Does the product work? And if the product works, does it matter longitudinally? And I think that's a more sophisticated impact lens than we've had in the past. Go to the next one. Let me see if there's any new questions. Nope. Okay. So somebody asked what our investment criteria is there. That's a nice um, 
And there's a lot in there, right? We can talk for an hour on each one of these, like what makes strong leadership and what makes something scalable, efficacy I just spoke to. Um, this, I think, is there's some there's some real there's some real genius around this customer focus. Um, one of my old bosses did all this um, Six Sigma training. Uh, it actually started at Motorola, but GE is the most famous for it now. And it's all about surpassing your customer's needs. So one of my uh, mentors did a really good job focusing us on customer satisfaction. And net promoter score is one of the highest correlations with a successful venture investment. And it's, it seems like it's common sense. But if, venture, if the company's customers are happy, then the venture investment seems to work. And so really looking at customer value propositions. And then in our space, the, the, the product or service we're investing in is who is the customer? Is it the student? Is it the, the university? Or is it the company? And what is the real value proposition? to the institution and to the, the, the end user. And then you can think of all these sales one-on-one, like who's involved in the buyer, buying decision. These are very complex sales if you're selling to a government institution or such. Um, we can go to the next one. This is important to differentiate ourselves. So value investing, we make sure that we're not hype investors and we can talk more about that. Um, these alternative pathways are kind of interesting. So when I talked about kind of 85% of people or more that don't really end up with a good job from people that start high school, what are some ways to get those people? And so there's boot camps and there's credentialing and there's trainings in prisons and there's job trainings and there's social emotional assessments and all kinds of different pathways to success. And I think more and more, you know, you guys will notice now, and if you haven't already, but start questioning the ROI of traditional educational pathways, given all the statistics that I talked about, but definitely stay in school. Mark, I, I wanted to ask you, value investing is a fascinating topic and it, because it's on this chart, could you talk a little bit about value versus growth investing and the two philosophies? Because everything is so hyped right now, and I think it's just a good thing to spend a minute on. Well, we have an expression. I don't think we invented it um, called uh, GARP growth at the right price. So we try and we try and do both of those. But um, there's a couple of books about Warren Buffett, but Warren Buffett's um, teacher and mentor is uh, Bill Graham. And Bill Graham wrote a book called a Financial Statement Analysis. And that is kind of the Bible for Warren Buffett. And if you want to be a good investor, you would, you would read that book. And, and basically, everybody's paying a multiple of cash flows. And it would be, it would be a good exercise. So I don't know, like, just give me a show of hands. How many people uh, could do a, uh, a net present value calculation? Okay, good. And so basically it's a net present value calculation as you look at investing, but without garbage in and without garbage out. And you don't price for perfection. And you fight off things like a bigger fool theory. A lot of that happens in venture capital. If you get, and um, if you watch things like uh, WeWorks or, you know, you brought up Tesla, is Tesla finally growing into its valuation? Um, or is it, is it really more valuable than General Motors? Um, what other companies have, have kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of fighting off the dot com. Uh, well, you guys weren't alive for that. It's fighting off of uh, bubbles, fighting off bubbles, fighting off trend investing, herd investing. It's being contrary. Um, 
but ultimately as a financial theory, you want to buy low multiples of cash flow. You don't want to overpay for multiples of cash flow and you want to be conservative about what you're estimating and you want to do your homework on each one of those inputs to a net present value calculation. So you can think about, you know, your, your terminal value for us, it's what the company would sell for to an acquirer. And so you do your homework, who are the 10 acquirers and what did they pay for this company? And don't think that they're going to pay some higher value for your company. And then your weighted average cost of capital. You need to make sure you're making the returns that your investors require. And you need to leave some room for companies that don't work or for struggles or for it to take longer. There's expressions like it always takes longer and it always takes twice the amount of money. So if it's going to take twice as amount of time and twice the amount of money, make sure you're pricing the deal to include that so that you get the returns for your investors. And it's just a lot of discipline and being conservative and doing a lot of hard work around your inputs and then staying true and not getting greedy. If there's a deal that's really hot, it seems hot and you want to invest, but it's not at the right price. You walk away. And it's hard to do that, especially when you're young. Thanks. Thanks a lot. That was a good. That's a hard one. It's a, it's a hard one. It's I mean, a Dodd, That book is like 2000 yeah. pages. I, mean, I, I grew up in a value investing world, you know, believing that was the best way to invest. And then the dot com bubble happened and everybody chased, you know, a few hot companies and they looked smart for a minute and then they all collapsed. So it's just a interesting thing to talk about. It's actually called securities analysis. That's what it's called. Not financial statement. Analysis. That's another good book. Though. Securities analysis. And there was a very, do people remember a company called uh, Living Social? It was a Groupon competitor. You guys know what Groupon is? So there was a DC based company called Living Social that sold for a billion dollars and then went to zero. And I didn't invest in it. And one of my, um, one of my colleagues invested $4 million and he took out $400 million. And he made the firm, the firm was called Grotech and he crushed it. And I thought it was the biggest Ponzi scheme I've ever seen. You were selling, they were buying a uh, dollar, uh, 50 cents of revenue, and they're spending a dollar to get it. And it just didn't seem sustainable to me. And so I missed the 400 X and then ultimately living social went to zero. None of the investors made any money unless you sold to another investor in the process. It went to zero revenue. And so boy, was I smart, but I, that was one where I should have played what I call the bigger fool theory or participate in the Ponzi scheme. Some investors, that's their whole philosophy, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't work for me over the last 30 years to not be a value investor. In my opinion, that, that stuff catches up with you, but it, it's a very clear example of where I missed a 400 X or hundred X to, uh, to stay true to my value investing. So it doesn't always work. So we have, we have five more minutes. And I think um, the exercise that we were going to do where, we, where you look at four companies and figure out what the SDGs are, we're going to save that for a future date because Mark was too interesting to listen to to, to cut them off early. Um, but why don't we wrap it up? What are, what are, how do you want to spend the last five minutes, Mark? Questions. Good Great. ones. I prefer bad questions. There's no, no such thing as a bad question. So do you want people to, to ask them out? Yeah, just go ahead and talk. Yeah, it doesn't seem like there's a whole list of uh, people. Anybody want anybody to challenge us or ask a question or disbelieve something we said or have a better idea? Anything you want to talk about? It's your, it's your time. Or, or ask a question that will help you be more successful in your life based on your own definition of success. I, first of all, thanks for taking the time today, Mark. Um, I, I did want to ask one question with regards to, I heard you were talking a little bit about the issue of hype investing, which is obviously a massive issue. Um, I mean, even today you can see it, for example, a few years ago, there was a huge investment buzz around marijuana companies. And uh, I- No pun impact, intended. No pun intended. But, but one of the main issues I see going forward is with impact investing. 
these companies that claim to have an impact component to them? Is it being overhyped for the sake of this ESG desire by a lot of companies, this idea to look good? Or is it genuinely just an entirely new space, one that can definitely be capitalized on without hype? So great question. Um, when I started this 30 years ago, there was very small asset allocation to impact. And now it's much bigger. So I would say it was maybe a half a percentage. And now it's about 15%, depending on how you look at it. So that's a, it's a massive increase in the asset class. It means different things to different people. And it's nice to be doing this for so long because I feel so clear about like non, it's non-binary to me. Like we would only invest in things that, that are proven that work. And we're very focused on, on a problem that we're trying to solve. So for me, I don't think too much about um, if there's hype or if we're, you know, there's something called greenwashing, right? Where you put a, an environmental spin on something and then maybe it'll sell more. Um, because I'm so down the line on efficacy and making sure there's both product level and longitudinal efficacy around what we do, I don't even think about um, questions around if there's real impact or not, right? Because that's so much, so much of the focus. So I think, you know, my answer is when you think about a, a specific product or service or a specific industry, you know, using your own opinion around theories of change, like, is there research driven? Is it a CO2 problem? Does it really lower CO2? Right. I mean, those things should be measurable and, and then you quickly become a thought leader in that space. The CO2 is the problem. Here's how we reduce CO2, right? If you spend the next five years on that issue, you would get invited to speak at conferences. You would be at the table of the people who are thinking about that. And so I guess there's ways to go into the field in a half-assed way, but I don't even, I can't even conceive of that. If I can add, there's a new company that launched this week called Blue Line, and they are the first impact verifying firm. So, you know, they will, you can hire them to verify that you're a bona fide impact investor or impact fund, as opposed to faking it like impact washing. So, and there's, there's groups that rate us. And sometimes it aggravates me because they want to know at the portfolio company level, like if that company recycles and what the kind of light bulbs they have. And all I care about is that they're changing the lives of students and whether or not they have the right light bulbs, I don't really care. So maybe I should, maybe we should just, everything we do should be enlightened and I should make sure, you know, we have three uh, X the diversity of typical venture funds across our portfolio, but it still doesn't represent the U S so is that good or is that bad? You know, those are, those are kind of pretty interesting questions around measurement. Like where does our responsibility stop? Thoughts on investing platform, Acorns and Vanguard. Um, yeah, well, Buffett is the one I listen to. I don't know much about public stocks. I always get cornered at a party about a public stock and I'm really good at taking a company from 5 million to 50 million in revenue. That's what I know. I'm one of the best in the country at it. I don't know too much about anything else, but um, I do know that index funds are the best cost return according to, to Buffett. And then I do put most of my money in things that screen out stocks. And those returns are about the same as every other index fund. So that's probably not that helpful. That's an, that's an opinion that's very uh, pedestrian, but I think I'm probably right. Nonetheless, I appreciate the answer. Thank you. Sure. I think we're out of time, but I wanted to say thanks to Mark for, for coming tonight and being our guest speaker. And thanks to uh, everybody who organized tonight. Thank you, Dr. Mahoney. Thank you, Ted. Uh, thank you, Jess, for running this, all the technology that got, got this, kept us moving smoothly. Thanks to all the students. Um, by all means, look up Mark online, New Markets Venture Partners. NewMarketsVP.com, NewMarketsVP.com. And I really do want to thank everyone for being on this and caring about impact and making a difference. It will, uh, it speaks very well to your character for everybody that's on this, this Zoom. Um, you know, 
working on making yourself a better person and, and having a positive impact, just a little ripple is pretty much all that matters in life. So you guys are all in a really good start just being on the call tonight. And you'll make a good living doing it. So it's worked out pretty well for me. <laughs> okay. Bye Thank for you. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I was wondering if I could ask, uh, what was the management? Oh, I think Chris Christian is gone. But do you guys remember what the management company he mentioned was that was looking at impact investments or impact? Oh, blue uh, line, blue line impact. Yeah, blue line impact verification. Okay, so sweet. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Ted. Have a good night. Uh, you too. Take care. Bye.